<clears throat> so welcome today uh, for another uh, World Federation Scobase Committee meeting and round table. Today we're going to be talking about odontoidectomies and uh, decompression of the brainstem and spinal cord, different pathologies and different perspectives. Um, so uh, thank you and uh, like to start with uh, Sadir. Well, uh, if you could uh, share your uh, cases and then we'll discuss. Opening up. And then Sami, do you have cases for the sequence as well? No, I don't have cases. We'll, uh, I'll be for the discussion. Do you have case, David? No, I don't. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I have a couple that we can we can show them. Let's start with Sadir. Go ahead, Sadir. You're muted, Sadir. Odontoid removal was very common around a decade back, but its incidence of doing that many surgeries has reduced. One of the reasons has been because there is an increased acceptability of C1, C2 distraction. So in case where odontoid is moving and it is fixed also, now you can put a cage between the C1 and C2 facet joint and get adequate uh, placement of the odontoid and that helps you a lot. The cage have really changed how you do the odontoid surgery. So the incidence of doing those surgeries have got reduced. But saying that there are still certain indications where despite this distraction, you are not able to achieve in cases of atlantoaxial dislocation, you are not able to with distraction also, you're not able to achieve the uh, yeah, either it's a uh, uh, Either it's uh, fused there or it is going basal invagination is there, which causes uh, us to do surgery. So if you are doing an endoscopic endonasal anterior parapharyngeal approach also we can do. So this is a video of how I do a odontoidectomy. I will split in the midline, uh, put two shells, how uh, bisection acts as a retractor most of the times. This is a C1 arch drilling. This is the space between the C1 arch and the odontoid process. You have to have an adequate uh, width at this place. And then you start to see when you uh, dissect the soft tissues, You that is what the odontoid looks like. You also drill sometimes the uh, anterior part of the foramen magnum, so your visualization increases. In the end, odontoid has to be, you have to make it like an eggshell, and then you have to pretty well deliver it. So in the end, once you have delivered, this is the last part of the eggshell. And then you have to remove the side bones also to make sure everything is perfect. and. Once you have released the ligaments, things become better at this place. In most of the cases, we if there is no CSF leak, you just put a inflate a fogati, and that probably does it. This is a historical this thing. This is probably one of my it's around 20 years back, one of my first cases of orontoid. We used to do everything uh, in a fashion which was transoral at that time. You used to cut the soft palate, which used to have some amount of problems in the post-operative period. Now, if I have to do a transoral, I will just retract the soft palate into the nose by giving a stitch. An end procedure is again the same. You have to leave a eggshell and you have to do the procedure. So this is a historical uh, slide, which is we used to do it in a transoral position. One of the interesting cases which we had or the patient of a meningioma ventrally placed and behind the odontoid, there was a, uh, this uh, uh, growth of uh, the ligament and as well as ossification here. 
So this was a rare case because uh, this ossification isn't related to this meningioma. It occurs because of some amount of instability at this place, which happens at uh, atlantoaxial uh, joint, and that causes this to happen. So uh, these were dual pathologies, but we're very near to each other. So because of the ventral route, we could address both of them together, but we had to do a posterior fixation because this is the pre-op, this thing you can see a lot of edema in the cord which was there and we could, we had an intra MRI so we could remove this till the end, we could take this out from the side. So this is what we could achieve in the end, but we had to go posteriorly to fix it. So that was required some amount of thing was left on the sides because you had to be eccentric slightly, the trajectory became slightly eccentric. So it was slightly difficult, but if you look from the nose, it was quite well, but if you look, there was some amount of component, but doing a posterior decompression and fixation took care of the patient in the post-operative period. And this is a post-operative uh, scan of the patient, which we did for this. Another case is similarly, uh, it's a cyst, synovial cyst, again, a amount of instability. And uh, there is uh, a kind of, uh, uh, normally we will see this kind of uh, thing in a patient with rheumatoid, a panis kind of a thing, but this was also happens in instability, which happens in this patient. For this, uh, I didn't use a conventional transoral approach. I went with a port from the sides of the foramen magnum. Uh, we went from the side means uh, we were around posterior lateral, around six centimeters from the midline. And we could expose from the sides, go ventrally. We could, uh, we landed on the C2 articular processes, the facet joints on the sides, and gradually made the space on the lamina. And then drilled it off. We used a micro retractor that port was limiting our ability to do this. We also did a screw fixation. So this is what you are seeing a screw. We did a minimally invasive at that time. You put a screw to stabilize the joint because everything is instability. So we put a screw. Now we are going to drill the lamina at the C1 and C2, and we'll go into that space and take out that cyst component which is there. So in this case, I had a, some amount of a CSF leak. This also shows some amount of CSF leak which was there. Patient did well, there was no post-op CSF leak, but I think a part of the drill took that out, a part of the dura there. So gradually making space from the sides in the corridor, we were able to go ventral. This is the dura which is there and we could go into the ventral space where we could find this cyst. And we could decompress the cord. So if you uh, look at this again, This is the part of the cyst which came out and then we could take it out gradually by dissecting from all the sides and taking it out. So, so this is my other case. Could you yeah. explain before you move forward, like uh, why you came from the side on this one? Do you mind uh, going back to the image? So the thing was, see, this shows instability, which is there. And if you look at the scan, just where the lamina is there of the C1 arch, you are just at bang on the... Uh, cyst which is there so and this is an angle from posterior can you show the arrow like what was your trajectory our trajectory was something like this oh okay that makes sense okay yeah and with this we could put the screw also means that's what i showed a screw going in so from mm -hmm. this thing we could visualize the screw and send it between c1 c2 fixation also we could do so that made a lot of sense for us to do this this is intraop X-rays means this is what it looked like when we did this thing off. 
basically you focus on the cyst instead of like uh, this create yeah. or and did the c1 c2 screws from that same from the same uh, uh, we could use so we could do this procedure well and this is the post operative mri of the patient which we did this let's so do this yeah. let's do some this discussion what i have oh perfect okay so uh, yeah sami what 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 do you think um so first of all i think uh, it would be interesting to hear from uh, from the panel uh, who still uh, perform uh, transoral approaches for these odontoids? Like, uh, Sami, go ahead. I don't. Transoral have so many problems <clears throat> after after surgery in terms of swallowing and CSF and repair infection. I mean, we had the last case I did was I had to do it for uh, for an extensive meningioma that was just go, going all the way down an anterior. We did endonasal, then we went back and did transoral. So. That was just mandatory. We couldn't really, but if, if we can avoid transoral, I really don't. I did one case in the last nine, nine years, maybe. Um, so I try to avoid that. Um, regarding the meningioma case, um, I would have probably done a far lateral approach and do posterior only everything, you know, posterior lateral and get the odontoid decompress because the penis will regress once you do fusion, once you stabilize, will regress. And the meningioma, if you look, there is a rudimentary uh, vertebral on the right side, and the meningioma is pointing to the right side. So the axis would have been okay there. I mean, it is a good job, there's no question. <laughs> uh, just to try to avoid anterior for intradural lesions like this, if you're gonna go posterior anyway, so you're gonna do fusion posteriorly. And the far lateral, when I do the hockey stake, the midline part of the hockey stake gives you this exposure that you can do fusion at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the second case, I would have done posterior, just regular posterior, because once you get lateral and you divide it in tate ligament, you have the cyst just pointing in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but also you did a like- This was an extra dual cyst, so. It was extradural. It was not inside the dural. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's delivering itself. Um, but you did a you did an elegant approach, so I can't really argue against. I'm just saying, yeah. my what see. would I have done? You know. Yeah. Let's see uh, what Alvaro has to say. Alvaro, are you there? Yes. Hello, Danny and everyone. Yeah, Hello. Alvaro. Alvaro is a master of this region of this code there. So let I'm curious to see what you have to say. At the first case, I couldn't see, sorry. And with the mm. second case, uh, I agree with Dr. Yosef. I prefer to go posterior or posterior lateral. Uh, usually in, in the anterior portion of the foramen magnum, of course, with the far lateral approach. And in the second case that I saw, uh, maybe it's just posterior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, um... David. David, all, all the way from South Africa. Mm -hmm. so most of these uh, regions get uh, uh, stolen by my spinal colleagues, uh, and I don't, I don't get, they, they don't get to to me, unfortunately. Um, but the, what 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 is interesting is, uh, is the point on the panis. My understanding is that if you if you fuse, the panis generally uh, does resolve. Um, what what I have uh, been exposed to by by my colleagues regarding the that cyst, um, it's quite an elegant approach that uh, is usefully employed, where um, they will go. Uh, really, just to a anterior approach to uh, the vertebral uh, to the vertebral column, and go trans disc with the with a spinal needle and aspirate that cyst. Uh, I think on on the one image, it looked like you may well be able to have achieved that. Um, and th that that type of approach, apparently, they've had uh, reasonable success, rather than having to do large uh, open open surgeries. Um, I don't know if that's something you you, you would consider. Good. Yeah, that's a good point. I never heard of that uh, with a needle. Usually try to get an approach there and in, uh, in, particularly if it's causing mass effect, but it's a, it's a interesting thought. Um, Walter, are, are, are you available to uh, give your thoughts? Mm 
maybe not. Um, is he as a co-host there? Um, uh, I, I'm wondering, we can go back to him, like uh, maybe Natalia can take a look. Um, so what I would say is that um, when I look at these lesions, particularly meningiomas, and I want to see what Alvaro thinks, um, it's, um, I, I think it's important that we don't create instability to, uh, in order to uh, uh, reach to the tumor. And uh, so I think if, like uh, Sami mentioned, I think if you have a meningioma located behind the odontoid, uh, usually I don't like to take the odontoid to get that to that meningioma. So that become it's one of the criteria that I use um, in order to uh, make a plan for meningiomas of the foramen magnum. So if it is behind the clivus and is very ventral, then I will consider coming ventrally endronasal. Uh, drew that clive was got to the tumor, but it, to create instability to take a meningioma out, I think is creating another disease. So that's I, I, I agree. I think that's when I I prefer to go lateral as well for for meningiomas. Um, Alvaro, do you have a case to show anything related to the odontoid or? No, no, I'm sorry. I, I oh, yeah, no problem. Wrote you yesterday. Okay, no problem. We'll, 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 your opinion is very important. And Walter, what do you think? Are you still doing a transoral? We are, but uh, so our practice is more on uh, based on tumors like chordomas, mm -hmm. and um, in fact, we are still doing uh, microscopic transoral surgery. And 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 one of the benefits of the microscopes, of course, that we're so used to it, and you know, it's very easy to do it. You, one single surgeon, two hand uh, technique. Uh, also, the suturing of the of the mucosa and the pharynx uh, uh, is easier that way. Um, and so, I want I wanted to ask the, the panel if you have an experience comparing the two. You know, the the uh, microscopic transoral versus the endoscopic transoral. Sometimes the the anatomy pre presents itself in a way that that uh, the transoral route is the logical way, basically, right? Uh, uh, and then and so then what do you do? Yeah, good question. The um, I, I I have done a transoral early in my my career and basically went away from that. Um, some some I've done a biopsy or some other specific things that we felt that that direction was better. But for a full resection of the for the most part, really uh, became a transnasal became the corridor that we use uh, these days. We had an interesting case where another uh, another center here near Columbus. They did a transoral for a, a scobase lesion that was in the odontoid as well, the current cervical junction. It was like a chordoma. And they want to decompress and biopsy. And they, they, they did transorally, removed 10% of the lesion, diagnosed chordoma. And now the patient has a full chordoma still there and has seeded chordoma through the entire uh, soft palate because oh, yeah. they cut the soft palate. And they had chordoma growing the soft palate when it came to us. So we, we had not only go through the nose and resect completely, uh, we, we removed some of the stuff on the seeding pathway, but there's not much you can do there. So we, we, then we had to give proton beam radiation to the skull base and to the soft palate because of the, pre, the previous approach seeded uh, disease over there. So uh, I always have to kind of comp, you know, have this in the strategy as well. What do you think, Sadir? Yeah, uh, you transoral has become because you on the sides you are limited bio exposure. So a better approach you involve your head and neck surgeons and do ventra parapharyngeal approach to odontoid. Your exposure is better than if you go transoral. So if there's a tumor, I didn't ha I have I have done some cases, but I had no recording of that. So if you have a tumor in that area, especially if you think it's a chordoma. It's better to do a parapharyngeal approach and you can reach odontoid and see it on the sides also. Okay. Or transnasal, I guess, depend on the case, right? Depend on the angle yeah. of the tumor as well. Right? Angle of the tumor and independent. Right, right, right. But uh, the other thing I want to say for chordomas, we have some chordomas that go all the way to the oropharynx. And, yeah. uh, and we had a couple of cases that we had to combine a transoral to almost like to push the tumor up and get. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can yeah. even put your finger in the mouth, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So that's another strategy that we, we have to take. So if you guys don't mind, I'll share my screen, have some, uh, 
some that I can show here as well, like uh... so here's what I was saying. Uh, just uh, can you guys see okay? I think so, right? Yeah, so so this is an example of a meningioma that is located ventrally in the in the foramen magnum area. And one of the things I always look is see, you see the apical ligament and the position of the tumor in relation to the odontoid. If it is above the odontoid, then I feel that I could come endonasal uh, without affecting the stability by keeping C1, C2 in the allied ligaments. Then it's something we can consider endonasal. But anything below that is when we start going far lateral. So here's that that line that we we looked, and the and this one we did uh, we did endonasal. Not going to go into uh, the details here. It's not related to the odontoid, but you can see the post op where where we were able to preserve the anterior arch of C1 and the uh, odontoid process. So this we did not create inst instability. Patient did very well with the uh, with that uh, with that situation. Um, if you look at tumor like this though. That is a different situation. Like now, it's not really a form of magnum meningioma. We're dealing with a meningioma behind the odontoid. And, and this is where I, I want to hear anyone in the, in the uh, panel would like to do this uh, trans, transoral or transnasal. Any, anyone doing that? I see Sammy moving your, your face there. <laughs> yeah, I have to look at the axial, but this in general, you know, I would do a far lateral approach. Yeah, Alvaro? Far lateral approach, always. Yeah. yeah, I've seen your videos, beautiful videos on this area where we, we got the whole tumor out far lateral, and that's what we do too. And then that way you don't touch the C1, C2. So I think this is, is very important uh, that we emphasize here today because a lot of uh, the initial work with the endonasal approaches, there was a lot of people excited about going through these. And, and I've seen patients that needed a fusion um, you know, by, by coming ventrally, and, and it's another disease in a way. But now I want to show you this case, very interesting. Um, this patient with the same position, if you look, has this disease calcified uh, behind the odontoid, causing severe uh, brain stem and, and uh, spinal cord compression. This patient was seen by another surgeon, neurosurgeon, who came from behind, like a midline, and tried to take this. It, this is an extradural disease, right? It's an osteoma, extradural. It's coming from the epidural space there, really severe uh, compression. So this other surgeon came, uh, opened the dura once, lateralized the spinal cord, opened the dura again, ventrally, and was able to barely biopsy that, that calcified mass. And the patient uh, ended up with a paraparesis. Initially, it was para, like a hemiplegic, and then it ended up with a hemiparesis, I'm sorry, uh, with spasticity. And, and about a year and change later, came to me, and, and, and he was already recovering from the manipulation of the spinal cord. And then... Um, I want to hear from from you guys. Like anyone here would consider, what type of approach would you do for these? Uh, it's like the width is of the the odontoid. It's not very lateral. It's just stay behind the odontoid. Uh, Sadir, what would you do this in India? How how would you do that? I will use a port to go from the sides and do it. Yeah, like from the sides. You mean from? Yeah, what? I just I showed the synovial cyst. I will just use that approach. Right, like you come you in the foramen or... magnum. You don't need to. Drill that area. You just need to go on the sides. Keep your things set. Be extradural. Gradually do more ventral work. Go on making a shell, drilling the shell. You need a navigation for this. And mm -hmm. once you have drilled a shell inside, then you can gently inside the shell. You can put like a corpectomy. Sometimes I do thoracic. Means I'm a portal surgeon, so this yeah, is the easy thing. Yeah. I, will, I will like to have this case. I know. So do you take it or don't try it to reach the osteoma? Though, no, no, right? no, no requirement. No? If you are lateral, you are no. entering from the side uh, where your C2 nerve root comes out. You are going from that side. You will have to sacrifice one C2 nerve root probably if it's on the way. And then you go on that way and you can make your space there adequately. But so, you have to be okay. so lateral so that you don't really retract the dural tube at all. Mm-hmm. 
How about you, uh, uh, Alvaro? Is calcified epidural? Well, yes, I don't have a case like that actually, but do you have an axial view? In I don't, to... right now I don't, I'm sorry. It's, um, but like I said, it's not as, it's like, a, it's almost like another odontoid behind. It's not very mm -hmm. large, but sideways. I mean, this okay. you're gonna have to come anterior. Mm -hmm. It's an extra yeah. dural disease. And unfortunately that to minimize manipulations on the spinal cord, you have to go straight to that calcified lesion or osteoma. I think anything yeah. not anterior would be dangerous. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, and, and basically, you, you pay the price of the stabilization, right? So you have to instrument it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what we uh, that's what we did just to show here. Uh, I felt exactly the same. I think more important than uh, instability creation here is really to solve the problem. So we came in nasal. I didn't need to drill much of the clivus there, but we got the archer C1 create an angle here with the odontoid. And got that whole mass out. It was kind of rocking there. It was once I disconnect from the base here, it was loose. We drew a little bit of that, made it a lot smaller, and then brought it out. And it, it got a nice decompression. He improved a little bit, but unfortunately, most of the deaths that he has permanently was from the initial manipulation of the spinal cord by a year before with the with the with the surgeon um, that did before. So. Uh, Couple of things here that uh, that I want to also uh, uh, bring attention is the fact that um, the uh, when you come in Indonesia, one thing that you ha always have to uh, pay attention is the uh, possibility of uh, presence of the carotid arteries. You can have dolly carotid arteries coming all the way to the midline, so you have to be careful when you use your bovi through the nasal pharynx. I think this is something that we learned a long time ago. And very once in a while, you'll find a case that the person has carotids that come close to the midline in the uh, peripharyngeal area. So it's amazing. They loop all the way in here. Uh, this case here, we actually did endonasal, and we had to use a silastic uh, pushing the, um, pushing the, uh, the, 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 the vessels down. And, um, and then, uh, money, you know, to be able to get to the odontoid. Uh, these are some other cases. I think we we talked about uh, earlier, like this the the presence of sign the the, the panels, and the panels is something that they may uh, really uh, disappear with uh, when you stabilize the patient. But uh, situation when you have bone there, then is a little different, and uh, and there's no option with that. So I want to hear the. When I hear the panel, when you um, uh, saw me, but do you, when you see panels, like do, do you go straight to a uh, fusion or you look at some other factor? The, the reason I'm, I'm asking just about panels is the, um, is the, uh, the, the fact that uh, for, for sometimes you have panels, but if we see um, a sign of like T2, on the spinal cord, usually we, we prefer to decompress and then fuse as well. So I want to. What do you guys think when they're well, with these new ones? This is more than a penis. This is the platybasia cranial settling of of the odontoid. So I think when you look at how the cranial cervical junction, the spinal cord, and the lower medulla, how they're wasted more anterior than anything. Um, I think you might have to decompress anterior. Alternative is to go posterior and decompress and fuse, but you don't really address the, the, the main issue, which is the cranial set settling of this odontoid. So, I mean, I'm like David, the spine guys would take care of this probably um, in, my, in my practice. When I see this, I just refer it to my colleagues. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. So the um, yeah. And how about if you see panel? Like I know this is not a panel, but uh, do you look at the spinal signal for for um, decompression or or no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know once you have that, that's another pointer to to more aggressive decompression. 
Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, posterior would not address the primary problem. So Correct. it would be yeah. Yeah. it would be just trying to avoid anterior. But in this case, I think you know my the spine colleagues will go uh, in, in, in like anterior approach to get the odontoid off the spinal cord and the uh, brain stem. Yeah, so dear, how about, how about you, so dear? Yeah, these days we get a lot of uh, AADs. These days, first approach will be going for C1, C2 joint, putting a cage, doing a distraction. If it comes down, then you don't, you just avoid the trans endonasal surgery or trans or whatever people are doing. If it doesn't settle down, then in the second stage, they will do that. Mm-hmm. They will do a posterior decompression. They will do C1, C2 uh, distraction, joint distraction, and put stabilize it first. And how how a, a case like this? Is this what you're talking about? Like one I'm showing? Yeah, like this also 90%. Until there's a fusion of the bone, if the CT is there, if the bone is fused from uh, the component of anterior part of the foramen magnum, if it is all bone, then it won't go down. Then 90% of these get reduced. Yeah, so... Yeah, this one we try, but uh, if you look at here, the clive was, this is a simulation yeah. of C1. You know, yes, you want a simulation that usually that doesn't, you know, doesn't really, uh, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't reduce. So we, we in this one we uh, we came in the nasal here just show uh, quickly how we do it. Uh, this is an old video just to show that the idea is to stay extra dural. Uh, this is this video is so old, like we didn't even have angle drills anymore at that time. Now we have all these angle drills that help us to go even lower. Um, back in the day with the straight drills, I actually had several cases I had to drill the hard palate on the patient's left side in order to be able to go lower with the drill um, just to get to reach uh, some of these uh, uh, abnormalities there at the cranocervical junction. So I go through the whole video here, but the um, we get basically it's very important to get all the way to Dura. Uh, in, panel, when you have panels, it's very uh, common that you, you get to ligaments and you don't, you don't pay attention. And you, it's a, there's always a potential for leaving behind some compression. So have to be very uh, meticulous uh, removing these uh, ligaments and panels and, and get to see Dura uh, all the way on the other side there. And then with that, I want to ask you uh, for like a little, little discussion about what do you do if you got a CSF leak in these uh, situations? So, um, uh, the uh, Sadir, have you had a like a situation with the? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So what we uh, I had two cases in which we had I managed with lumbar drain, but uh, ventrally because there is the flap will not go to that extent there. So uh, it becomes difficult. So mostly we put a glue and we try to formulate. We'll put an artificial dura and put the T-seal. That's what we do most of the cases. You try to put fat? Yeah, fat graft also. But that yeah. won't, there's not a lot of space. Uh, the amount of exposure which we have is less than uh, probably more than not more than around 1.5 to 2 centimeters. So that space is very less behind as you go. Yeah, what I what I also do is uh, if there is a hole, I had one, I had two cases with CSF leak uh, coming in odontoid endonasal. One very interesting, there was fluid around the panels uh, that was going all the way to the submucosal area of the nasopharynx. When we opened the mucosa of the nasopharynx, CSF was coming out. So basically, the panels actually perforated the dura. And caused uh, like it was not iatrogenic. It was the disease that caused that fistula. And uh, I was able to go all the way back there, clean everything. We did the whole surgery with CSF coming through. And then uh, I tried to uh, plug with Duragen. So basically, I got a little collagen matrix. I plugged that uh, hole. And then uh, the odontoid is a nice corridor deep that actually, if you put fat, it's a nice, it stays there. Uh, and that's what we did for for the other case was the atrogenic when we were kind of cleaning with the uh, with the kerosene and, and also got a little CSF like in a in a very small pinpoint. That one I wasn't able to really pass a, a collagen matrix. We tried to plug with something, but it, it was making the hole bigger. So then we basically just put like fat nicely compact in front of it. Uh, I believe we used some glue on top of it, and the patient did very well. Uh, both cases didn't leak after surgery. So uh, it's very important to have that in mind because 
if you create a leak that you don't pay attention, then you, if you turn the patient to do a fusion at, at the same scenario, same anesthesia, then you're going to be leaking down there, and uh, you know it can be a, it can be a real issue. Um, that's a, another good question that I have for for you, Sadir. Do you uh, fuse the patient at the same day? Do you wait? Do you put in a halo? Uh, we will what, what first do. We'll do first posterior one posterior fixation because that has a, as I told you, 85% chance that you don't require an anterior surgery. So first do that, decompress the posterior elements. So you will be in a better position and then you can do it after a few weeks. You can do on the next day, endonasal mm -hmm. you can do later on. So posterior is first in all these kind of cases. Okay, interesting. We do a little different. We we, if we see spinal cord like injury, like if it is uh, um, with a signal on the spine and patient has weakness or hyper uh, reflexia, things like that, we go into nasal, we remove the panels, then on the same anesthesia, we flip the patient and fuse um, on the same, at the same time. Um, if there is no signal on the cord, then, then just fusion, like you said, then, uh, then the panels will regress with time. It's just for patients that are more symptomatic that we, that we do that, or if there is a bony component like the ones that we you've seen there. Sami, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I we do the same. So the few cases that needed fusion um, for extensive chordoma, for example, and this you have to use peak uh, in instrumentation mm -hmm. because of the radiation afterward or the proton beam, but we did it within twenty four to forty eight hours. Um, mm -hmm coming back and doing posterior fusion after doing the anterior resection and decompression. And do you, do you keep the patient a collar or? Yeah, we, uh, no traction. We just keep the patient bed rest in a collar, Aspen. Yeah. Actually, and it's just 24 hours. Yeah. Um, I think one of the cases we kept intubated overnight and we took the patient back in the, in the morning to do the fusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a patient that uh, that I did exactly that. Um, this was more like a panos uh, going going through there. You see a little signal on the spinal cord. She did have symptoms from that. We decided to come in the nasal and take this out. And we this is one in my career that we didn't fuse right away. We actually kept in a in a collar and then did the fusion from behind a, a few days later. Uh, it had like a finger going to the spinal cord there. The this is uh, the post op and then uh, fusing this. The other question is like uh, I know most of you guys are not spine surgeons, but it's interesting. I collaborate with the spine surgeons uh, to do this. Some are ortho, other are neurosurgeons. They have a little bit of a different concept. This case um, it was considered just an instability uh, panels created by the uh, instability of C1, C2. So we took care of that finger that was going down there. And we didn't remove the entire C1, and the uh, my spine surgeon uh, decided to not fuse to the skull, just fuse C1 and C2. Um, what do you think about that, Sonny? Yeah, I was going to say, for with what you did here, um, you might just get away with C1, C2 uh, mm -hmm. fusion. I'm not yeah. sure how much of the apical ligament and the alar ligament is probably still there, but... Yeah, wow. that's what that's what we uh, felt like uh, because I really went up, um, really preserving uh, the Archer C1. We came on top here, got part of the odontoid. That was enough to reach this area and clean the epidural space. And then my, like I said, my uh, partner there, like a spine surgeon, decided to just do C1, C2. This patient did perfect, and yeah. it's beautiful because her movement of the head is basically normal. Yeah, sixty percent of the rotation happens there, so I mean yeah. it's gonna be. Yeah, yeah, this was a nice sleep. For the for some of the other ones, very brutal uh, uh, compression, then uh, those were, uh, we, we, we usually go all the way to the uh, skull there. Uh, this is another one showing behind the odontoid. This patient had a previous trauma uh, with the odontoid uh, broken that was managed conservatively, and then it generated this panos. And then he started having a, uh, signal in the spinal cord and, and, and changes. So this, we also can end on nasal. Uh, these are just some examples. Um, this is another crazy one. Look at that, Alvaro. What would you do here? Uh, difficult. <laughs> Let me see. 
It's like a bamboo cervical spine. <laughs> Exactly yeah, exactly like a bamboo. Very big odontoid. Yeah. Do you see this in India a lot, Sadir? Yeah, you see them. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. You guys have the largest population of the world now. Yeah. The... Yeah. We overtook China. Yeah, yeah. God bless you, man. God bless. Um, so, but here uh, we decided to just focus on that part there, and. Um, and basically came, we had to see, you see, there's a C1 assimilation, a little bit of platybasia. So we had to do part of that, a uh, uh, platybasia. Clive was, we drilled the uh, C1 assimilation. And then it's interesting because you have a little herniation of fibrous tissue here that you have to retract up to reach all the way up to this top of the odontoid. And this, there's no way you can reduce or, you know, it will never put in traction. This may be dangerous, actually. It may break this or, in a situation that is worse. So we went in Indonesia and got that part out. It looked like this at the end, um, you know, with a decompression in the- uh, So Danny, now that you provoked me with this case, I have an interesting case to show. That's crazy, ahead, yeah. this one. <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to stop here. I'm just showing- a... Yeah, once once you finish, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like go ahead and share yours. It's something that you might maybe see once in a lifetime, if you ever do that. Okay. Okay, so this is a poor guy, you know, it has one of those collagen syndromes, congenital progressive myelopathy. So he had the uh, previous Chiari decompression and he had basilar invagination, a syrinx, so he had decompression. He had a VP shunt. Everything was done posteriorly before. And he has occipital to T3 fusion. Now he kept was progressive myelopathy. And um, let's see. So this is his CT scan showing the odontoid all the way up to the third ventricle. Let's see if this will play. Yeah. God bless me. Unbelievable. <laughs> let's mm -hmm. see if this will. Uh, So you see here, everything is intracranial. Wow. So look at his odontoid is all the way to his hypothalamus almost. And you see the posterior decompression and the odontoid process is all the way up here, but the compression now is happening from uh, C3, C4 right there anteriorly. And everything is just behind the nasopharynx. Um, so this is my spine colleague's case, and yes, that's our, our opinion. And basically, you're not going to go up there, but here, that's the main compression um, that we need to deal with. And like you said, uh, Danny, you see the mm -hmm. signal here, but the syrinx as well from, yeah. from that. Yeah. yeah. So what did you do? So we did anterior endonasal. To like do a C3, C4 corpectomy through the nose. Yeah. I think you're the only one ever done that. This case is, you yeah, know, so usually you don't reach C3, yeah. C4, but uh, it was so just, you know, the flap opening the, that in this case, you know, it's pretty much the oropharynx that you're going through the nose to do. Um, so we drilled that anterior using the, the sonopet here. And I'll show you what's more crazy is. It's trying to put a graft anteriorly, a strut graft through the nose. And the question, of course, you know, I mean, we had to use betadine and stuff, you know, to potentially not, or at least, you know, try not to get bacteria into the graft, into the, right. the, the vertebral column. So here's the graft, the strut graft going in and I'll try to position that in the knees. <laughs> it's something, like I said, you know, we've never, we've never done. It's just, we had to do this and he came back from posterior and revised the fusion because, you know, that with that 
anterior uh, kyphotic deformity means that the posterior fusion is not is not in place or fusion is not happening so we did this and he had to come posteriorly and revise the posterior fusion mm -hmm. and no problem with infection here or something no we didn't have infection but this guy has other issues like you know sure. with his mm -hmm. congenital syndrome then we put the flap back on this you know and uh, a nasopharyngeal flap right you mean not yeah not, yeah. yeah 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 then is it the his nasal his myoperiosteal uh or right. mucus mucosa and uh muscle put it back okay. so yeah this is something like I said and I just figured to show it because you don't see that often yeah so dear you thought that only in India you saw these crazy cases huh no no I I have to this is this is unimaginable <laughs> <laughs> it, this one is incredible yeah kyle do you have any uh anything you have to say there no i mean that's a pretty incredible case <laughs> putting the hard work in the nose. <laughs> that's, great awesome. that's a great case <laughs> kyle is uh my fellow here guys um he uh he, he's uh, doing doing wonderful hey yeah uh, so let me uh share uh and um just finish a year. Let's see if I still have a. Where is my thing? I have to reopen. Give me a second. Just to finalize, here's some thoughts. Uh, one thing that uh, I want to show you is uh, this idea that has been very good and. Uh, you see Guilherme Finger here on the on the call there. He's a a, a research fellow and working a lot on these uh, in the, like uh, probes that we can put through the nose with ultrasound. This is an old one. I published on this long time ago. But this is um, the idea is when you decompress, you take it out, and sometimes you don't know. Like I was saying, the pen is still there. Like is the decompression satisfactory or not? This is um, this is some uh, cases. And then you can put a you can put an ultrasound all the way after you take the odontoid. Once you remove the bone, you can, the the uh, imaging you can read all the way to the back, and you can see here this is the spinal cord, and you see space in front and space below. Deep here, that's the uh, the posterior part of the uh, from magnum, and the thickness of the uh, uh, tissue behind the odontoid and panels is going to be there. So I, I can play again. It's kind of difficult to read, but it's really uh, good. And then um, you see the space and you see pulsations and you know it's decompressed. So just something to have in mind. Um, it's not every uh, company that has a probe that goes through the nose, but there's a there are a couple out there. I'm not gonna go into names here, but that's the idea that uh, I, I think is something that uh, it can be very uh, helpful uh, to get the uh, proper decompression. Uh, when it's you the concept of... Uh... Pediatric neurosurgeons, when they do Chiari decompression, and they do that to check if they need to do duroplasty as well or just stay extradurally. So they do the same. They get the ultrasound and do exactly what you did. Yeah. Let me see if I have a, a, with the more modern uh, picture to show you guys here just to finalize. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, the... I have it here. It's in a different talk. Just give me a second. Uh, Guilherme, do you have there easily or no? Uh, I have on my computer, not on my cell phone. I'm sorry. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, but I think that oh I have I have not a video. I have I, I actually I have, have a video, I think. I can play it for everyone. You do? I have the one that Glare may made. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me play let me play it for yeah, go ahead then. Sure. Should be showing up or yeah. We start from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, this is a um, case we did uh, through the nostril and the... Uh, yeah, let me show the imaging. I'm sorry. Let me get me back up a bit. Yeah. It had some panels, calcified panels component, yeah. Yeah. 
prior fusion below as well. So the approach, I think you all know, so I can skip all this. Yeah, just go to the- uh, <laughs> no, just, yeah. Here we go. This is axial view here. And I think we'll have a sagittal view as well coming up. It's a great tool though. I mean, I think for the panics because the soft tissue, I was thinking about it, the other case you presented, Danny, with the um, calcified mm -hmm. extradural tumor. I'm not sure how useful it would be with the calcification. Um, I'd be curious to see, you know, in that yeah, case. Probably, probably not, yeah. For these panaces, I mean, it's incredible. And I think for me, I, I think the big, um, you know, a difference is that, you know, we weren't always resecting these when I was training and, and at Brigham, um, you know, saying the fusion is we diffuse a lot of these patients, right, would, would deal with the panis, um, it would, you know, cause it to you know, settle. But like this patient has significant myelopathy, he recovered in the hospital after the odontoidectomy because we resected so much panis. He recovered very quickly and, you know, it's back to basically a normal baseline before he had total, you know, myelopathy and unable to, you know, live his normal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's all these ligaments. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. You see the CSF flow, the beating. Yeah, and you can see the ventral. You can move in front of the, the spinal cord there, yeah. The total, total decompression, so. And it's nice because then you know if you need to take more ligaments, you need, need to work harder to get all that decompressed. If the probe is small enough that you might do a paramedian trough, and before you take the entire thing out, you have a baseline signal, then after yeah. you decompress, you check it again. Yeah, 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 you can. As long as you take the bone, you start having your baseline after. Take right. the, so you take the bone, you do your baseline, then you keep going and keep checking. You go in and out to the probe is actually very nice. I think we're going to use more and more of this technology is very, um, very helpful. For this approach, for odontoidectomies with panels is really helpful. Um, and I, I would like to, let's see here if I, uh, let's see. Can I, uh, Guilherme, can you uh, make uh, Dr. Uh, Roberto Leal? Oh, Jumoto is here. Hey, Jun. Can you uh, uh, free up uh, Jumoto and Roberto Leal, please? Hello. Good evening. Hey, Jun. How are you? Yeah, good. So now in Japan, uh, 11 p.m. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, long day. No, 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 no problem. Yeah, do you have any uh, any final consideration before we finalize here on the odontoidectomies? Any any thought? Uh, no. N no, you agree? Yeah. Sounds good. The uh, uh, is Roberto Leal? He's not there anymore. Huh? No problem, Walter. Uh, Final thoughts? No, sorry. This was this was nice to see, and uh, some very strange cases, guys. Uh, it's 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 good, you know, that we interact with the spine guys uh, with about these cases. Nice, yeah. nice presentation, Dan. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that's the uh, most important aspect. All of these cases discussed as a multidisciplinary team, uh, go case by case. Sadir brought very good points about not only the minimally invasive aspect of coming anterolateral that I really enjoy, but also uh, the possibility of, uh, of retracting and, and you know, like uh, solving the problems without the need for major surgery, um, decompressing, and then sometimes fusing uh, without the need for taking the panels out. I think you gotta look case by case. So having multidisciplinary team, very important uh, to really get the best for the patients with less invasiveness as possible. Um, Sami, I'll let you uh, say some words and then before we close. No, I agree. I used to call this area the spine base um, surgery because that's where you meet with the spine surgeons. And I think everything we do in the skull base multidisciplinary and you have a great team, Danny, of course, you know, and when you have Rick Carrao with the head and neck background, he can also mm -hmm. bail you out from that uh, nasopharynx, oropharynx problems. So it's good to have to have the team and also these are the people that can stop you from doing like the disastrous move. Yeah. So this synchronized, like not dance, but surgery. I think it's a good, uh, good to have a team in place. Um, and this is, this is 
more than just that, you know, when you get the spine surgeon, the technical cervical junction, that's a great collaboration. Yeah, I agree. And um, yeah, so so having, like you said, the ENT, neurosurgery, neurosurgery spine, sometimes ortho spine, <clears throat> uh, all together, uh, you know, do the best for the patient. Well, with that, I'll, uh, I think we are uh, almost at the hour here. So uh, thank you, everybody. We'll once again post this uh, nice discussion uh, in the YouTube, uh, in our channel there. And um, thank you all. I appreciate. Enjoy right, your see everybody. Rest of, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. For some of you guys, it's just a few minutes of Saturday, <laughs> like June. Thank all you. Right, thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.